So my topic today is around, um, it's, it's a keynote speech as John has asked me to do, and it's, I'm going to take you on a journey. And that journey I'm going to conclude with that blockchain itself is like looking in the rear view mirror of your supply chain. And I'll explain what I mean by, by that. Now for me, I want to thank John and uh, Subacious for the opportunity and also Mr. Milk to present because I'm actually from Galway. I'm from Galway City. My father worked at uh, the old UCG or NUIG in the anatomy department. So I spent a lot of time on the grounds of the university and my company name is Shanta, which is actually where I was born. So uh, it's, it's great to, uh, to be able to, uh, to help out today with the, uh, with the keynote. Now, if I go on to what I want to talk about today, I'm going to take you on a broad journey. I'm going to talk about food chain complexity in the broad sense. And I'll show you the key challenges. And as I go through each of these slides, you hopefully will pick up the areas where blockchain may work and where blockchain will be a challenge. I'll talk about transparency and I'll introduce transparency more to the theoretical side. I'll give you a definition of transparency. And I'll also talk then about uh, the issues with transparency. And then I'll go into trust and I'll give you a definition of trust and then talk about the challenges in there as well. And then I'm going to open up into our diverge, I should say, into a new supplier challenge, because this is really an area where blockchain can add a significant amount of value. And I'll, I'll share some practical and theoretical perspectives on why blockchain can be very, very important in setting up new exchange relationships in supply chains. Then I'll briefly look at technology complexity and the, the landscape out there. Uh, and then I'll go into blockchain and I'll give you the pluses and the minuses of blockchain. And I'll conclude with a section on why looking in the rear view mirror is important, but also uh, what are the other things that we need to do? And I'm gonna put that in context of resilience, which is uh, a broader concept, but I'll hopefully explain to you why blockchain is very important in this context and why blockchain is not the only solution that we need to look at. And I'll summarize and I'll pull all of that together. And, and when I do summarize, I'll use the metaphor of driving a car just to bring, bring home some of the examples that I'll talk about with the different technologies. So for people who are not familiar in depth with how all of these technologies fit together, I'll use a metaphor to kind of bring that home. And then I'll give you some resources that you can look at as well. Okay, I've been using this slide for about 15 years, at least 15 years. When you look at a supply chain here, this is a very simplified model. This is a model, if you look at the right hand side, there's a meal, some salmon, some potatoes, I know they look like eggs, and some lettuce and so on. And look at the supply chain. Now this is a very, very simplified uh, model. The yellow lines here represent the potato supply chain. And the potato supply chain, we know that we can buy from retail. A retailer will buy from a wholesaler. Wholesaler will buy from a packing house. And the packing house will buy from multiple farmers. And herein, I just want to use this simple example to talk about what happens at these packing houses. You will have commingling of, uh, let's say, potatoes from multiple farmers. So traceability, in a lot of cases, will break down when, when you get into a packing house scenario. And many, many do not cater for that when we look at uh, supply chains. And when we look at uh, chopped lettuce or leafy greens that are blended together, co-mingled, and then they ship out. So technology is one aspect of the solution, but also analytical science is a critical component. And I'll explain why. Now, before I go on to that, if you look at this supply chain here, there's no, there's no countries, but of course we know that supply chains are global. We have many countries involved. We have many languages and we have many different regulatory frameworks and we have thousands of different technologies and ways to do things, different business practices as well. So this is, as Fiona was talking about earlier, standards become very important because standards are generally technology independent or technology neutral and they help us share data across different geographic and language boundaries. This is why anything that we do, whether it's blockchain or any other traceability system, will need to have industry standards in there like the GS1 standards for data and information and also interoperability to help us share data across platforms. So when we look at the supply chain and we look at this fish here, we're, we're asking ourselves, what kind of fish is it? 
what species is it? Is it wild caught or is it, uh, is it farm salmon? Now you may have paid, let's say a 30% premium for wild caught salmon, but is it really wild caught salmon? And what species of fish is it? We know that work that Alan Riley did, Professor, Professor Alan Riley, he's the former CEO of the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. And it was Alan's team that uncovered the horse meat scandal. But last year, Alan did a project for the UN FAO on fish fraud globally. And in that uh, summary of what's going on worldwide, there's between 20 and 30% of fish are mislabeled worldwide. Now, when, you, when, when we talk about being mislabeled, uh, we're talking about, it could be a $1 fish presenting or being sold as a $6 fish. But we also have mislabeling of fish that are unsuitable for uh, consumption that are also being sold in, in markets. So these are some of the challenges that we have. Now you have to ask yourself a question, can blockchain help with this? And the answer is not really. And I'll explain that as I go on here. So is my milk diluted or adulterated? Those of you who are very, very familiar with the global milk market know that we have problems in many countries around the world. Recent studies out of China suggest there's still significant uh, milk adulteration. We know in India, in some states in India, you have up to 70 or maybe 90% of milk that that's, uh, has a problem. And, and of course, we know the melamine crisis in China a number of years ago where scientists and the operators, the four largest dairy companies in China were implicated in this. They watered down the milk and essentially they knew how the technology was used to, to test for protein in the milk. So when you water down the milk, you reduce the protein content. So what they did was they added melamine. So here you had good actors, scientists colluding together to be opportunistic and to try to defeat the system. Now the issue of why that occurred is more related to the fact that dairy was very new in China and they weren't aware of that being a risk. For six years, I lived in Asia up to last year in June. And I did a lot of work in an analytical laboratory in Ho Chi Minh. So we think that the, we thought that the melamine crisis was gone. But in December, 2018, when I was at the lab, we uncovered melamine in animal feed in, uh, in, in Vietnam, up around the, around the Hanoi area. And that was from feed that came in from China. So the problem hasn't gone away. Now, if you look at your food, this is very complex to do. Is my, is my food really organic? Uh, and is there heavy metal contamination in my food? I'm, I'm sharing these with you because we think that technology can solve a lot of the problems, but it cannot solve a lot of these issues. So for example, three years ago, I was in a, a briefing with the FDA in, in Washington. And the FDA said that children under the age of three should not be consuming any rice products whether it's normal rice or rice crackers or even uh, uh, food with, uh, with rice in it. And the reason for that is because of the heavy metal contamination and the naturally occurring arsenic in the rice. And in some countries they have more naturally occurring arsenic than others. Their argument was that the child does not have the body mass to be able to process that. Now, the EU does a much, much better job of controlling this, especially in baby, baby food than other countries. So there was an expose in Canada last year by one of our investigative journalists that found a significant amount of arsenic in the toenails, toenail clippings from moms and new babies. So the problem is still in there. Could, could blockchain solve that? Absolutely not. We know in the US there was a major fraud uh, was uncovered last year. About $100 million of organic grains were sold and it was all uh, fraudulent. The CEO of that company, the main person that was uh, responsible for it, he was sentenced to 10 years in jail. And uh, unfortunately, he ended up taking his own life rather than going to jail. So as I build that slide, you can see all of these other things here. We know about honey, Honeygate. Um, is there chemical or pesticide residue in my products? Can blockchain do that? Absolutely not. What allergens are present in my product? Can blockchain do that? Absolutely not. Is, is my beef, uh, is this 100% beef? We know from the horse meat scandal, a blockchain could help with the, the transactions within the supply chain itself. And actually the horse meat scandal uncovered what we call blind trust in the EU framework to protect consumers. And that blind trust uh, has been addressed uh, to a large extent right now. 
Can I verify there's no pork in, in my, uh, or alcohol in halal products? And is this rice or coffee from Vietnam? So for example, when I was in uh, living in Vietnam, I had this trader come to me and say, John, I want a blockchain. And I said, why? They said, I want to be transparent and I want to build trust. And I said, why, what's the problem? And, and then the person said to me, well, we don't want the farmers to be doing all that food safety stuff. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, blockchain, if we have a blockchain, then overseas buyers will say, oh, you have a blockchain, we can trust you. I said, that's not how it works. You have to build on a foundation layer of food safety and build up from that. You can't eliminate the on-farm food safety work. So in that case, you had someone who was a good actor, was misinformed, and would have been bringing products to the market that were not from Vietnam. And I'll give you an example here of, is the rice or coffee from Vietnam? But let me build to the last point here. Is my food safe to eat is critical. But this point that I have at the bottom, it's natural science <clears throat> or analytical science that enables transparency and trust in supply chains and in food chains in particular, because of the objective certainty in terms of the ascertainable and verifiable characteristics of food products. This is not the realm of blockchain. We need to have analytical science that can prove all of these things that I have on the slide here. This is a very, very important notion. Let me give you an example. So in that example here of is the rice or coffee from Vietnam, it, when I was living in Vietnam, farmers or traders would buy cheap carrots and potatoes and other products like ginseng from China. And if they put it onto a blockchain, they'd say, yeah, the provenance, the geographic source or origin is Vietnam. But when you do a, a different analytical testing on that, which could be a carbon 13 analysis of it, it'll tell you the physical piece of ground that that product came from. So herein lies the biggest single problem that I have with blockchain marketing today. They confuse data provenance when the data was entered into the platform with the scientific provenance or true provenance of the actual product. And this is one of the biggest, biggest issues today with, uh, with blockchain marketing, confusing data provenance with the scientific provenance. And I'll come back to that with the Walmart example later. So we know that there's lots of examples out there, um, lots of uh, research that says consumers want companies to be more transparent, they're willing to pay more and so on. Now here's an interesting uh, slide. I put this together a number of years ago. And the reason I put it together was to get organizations to look at the supply chain from different lenses. There are five natural um, pillars in the food industry. So food quality is one. Food safety is the food safe to eat. Food authenticity or food fraud, which is a big problem in itself. Food defense is a term that many people don't know about, but food defense is really, it's about, is there somebody trying to kill us? This is more of the ideological side, the terrorism side, and this is a significant uh, issue today. We don't talk about it because we don't want to give the bad guys some ideas. And food security is often confused with the security of the shipment, but of course, food security is the ongoing supply of safe, affordable, nutritious food that meets our needs. So across all of these five pillars, you can actually look at, is there a blockchain use case that helps us with food quality? Is there a blockchain use case that helps us with food safety and so on and so forth? And the reason why I point this out is that you can take a vertical approach to this at the industry or government level, and you can also take a horizontal approach to that. And when I'm having conversations with governments or with large companies, I talk about this in, in a lot of detail. Just to give an example of some of the numbers, we don't know yet the size of the global risk with, uh, with food fraud. It could be in the region of 10 to $50 billion. <clears throat> but we do know in the area of food security that it's nearly a trillion dollars of, uh, of concerns worldwide. And if we go down to the foodborne illness cost here, the foodborne illness, about $110 billion annually in low to middle income countries. So when you go out talking to the industry, you talk to governments, you talk to NGOs about using blockchain, their focus around these big topics, their focus is on primarily around food security, about reducing food loss, about ensuring that we can eliminate hunger uh, right around the world. So when we come with Western developed notions of enhanced transparency, we can't be generic and say that the whole world wants this because they don't. 
So we have to be very specific. Even in the US, the demands for transparency on the West Coast may be quite different than the demands on the East Coast. So we can't be too generic when we talk about transparency and trust or requirements for traceability and consumers' willingness to pay for additional information. I would suggest, and, and several of my expert colleagues also suggest that potentially, potentially up to 10% of all food that's commercially sold could be at risk of some form of food fraud, <clears throat> whether it's mislabeling or other information that's missing. Now, from a food fraud perspective, I want to point out a few things here. Down at the bottom right here is something that's very interesting. The U.S. federal court said that the FDA was in breach of its fiduciary duties by allowing uh, GMO salmon to go to market without verifying all of the risks. So that's quite interesting. This happened just last week. And we know with the Oregano spot check in Australia that was repeated by uh, Chris Elliott, Professor Chris Elliott at Queen's University Belfast, there was a significant amount of fraud with oregano. Now I collected oregano from about eight countries and I sent it to Belfast as well. And it comes back with different types of adulterants. And herein lies part of the issue. When you look at the adulterants in, uh, in oregano, one of those adulterants was myrtle leaf. Now myrtle leaf is actually used in Chinese medicine and it has a medicinal purpose. So the risk actually can be you know, made more significant when the adulterant actually has medicinal purposes. Um, that's a big risk for us today. Now, a spot check was done on oregano in the last couple of months. And luckily enough, the industry seems to have cleaned itself up and there was only one or two cases of fraud uh, identified. Now they've moved on to sage and they're finding a significant amount of fraud in sage. So we know the risk areas, uh, you know, uh, meat provenance, mixing meats together, but herein is part. Herein lies some, uh, something that's legal, but often seen as illegal. So in Canada last year, or a few years ago, I should say, um, the University of Guelph tested sausages, and there were beef sausages, but they found DNA from multiple other animals in the beef sausages. Now you could run to the press and say, "Oh, fraud, 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 fraud," but in fact, it's legal. It is legal under a certain percentage, you can actually put in other animals into uh, your mixture up to a certain level, and you don't need to put it on the ingredients label. Now, is that fair? Is that trusted? Should consumers be concerned about that? I would say yes. So we know that across the spices world, there's significant uh, fraud. We know in honey, we had honey Honeygate. And when you get into areas like halal, which is more of a process or kosher, we also have a lot of fraud in there. In Canada, some of the uh, investigation that was done by Oceana last year, in, in cases of uh, with red snapper, 100%, 100% of the red snapper being sold was actually not red snapper. And the bulk of the testing across Canada, across the major cities, highlighted about 44% of uh, mislabeling, which is quite significant. And when you get into uh, credence claims, now, credence means something that cannot be verified before or after purchase by the consumer. So I'll say that again. A credence claim is something that cannot be verified before or after purchase by the consumer. So this is why companies will use labels like USDA organic. USDA organic, that has got what's called strong signaling strength. So that strong signaling strength is a proxy for trust for the consumer. So when you see companies using a claim on a product, it becomes a proxy for trust. The key is, like the previous speaker pointed out, to give the consumer a method to be able to query that claim and to verify the information. So the previous example that you saw of being able to mine into the data where the consumer can verify that is a good way to look at how it, a, a, a label is used on a product or a QR code as a proxy for trust and then the consumer can go and verify that. That's, that's a trust enhancing mechanism. Now on transparency. So transparency, there's a lot of words being thrown around with transparency, it's sincerity, clarity, honesty, believability, and, and so on. And my favorite definition is from Geert Jan Hofstede, who was a Dutch professor. Now you may know that name Hofstede, his father is Geert Hofstede, 
And he's the guy that came out with this, the cultural studies in the 1980s. So this is the son of the famous uh, um, uh, bringer of those that those cultural studies in the 80s. I think he did it with, uh, with IBM. So Professor Hofstadter talks about transparency of a net chain. Now net chain here means a conflation of both the network and the supply chain together. So transparency of a net chain is the extent to which all the net chain stakeholders have a shared understanding. Now think of that shared understanding. GS1 standards will help you with that shared understanding. It's very, very important. And of course, access to the information is important. Again, as our previous uh, speaker talked about, uh, there's no point in having all of the data in a centralized database if nobody has access to that data. And it's product related information that they request. Um, I spoke with a uh, Chinese uh, CEO uh, when I was over in China and she said, John, we have a great uh, consumer market here in Shanghai and our consumers are primarily moms. So what we did was we actually wanted to be radically transparent. Now, I, I, I say that word radically transparent because I wanna use it with caution. If somebody talks to you about radical transparency, say John Kyo said, you have to leave the room right now. And I say that because we don't know how to do simple forms of transparency, let alone radical. Having said that, I will show you an example of one company called Everlane that's aggressively looking at, uh, uh, at radical forms of transparency. So he talks about it's, it's information that they request. So in this context of the Shanghai company, I said, what did you do? And she said, well, we actually included a PDF, a 14 pages of PDF of all of the analytical laboratory testing that we did with every order. And I said, what was the results of that? And she said, well, not good. Because the mom said to us, we didn't ask for it. We don't need it. And you scared the crap out of us. So this is very important. It's information that they request and without loss, noise, delay, or distortion. Now, I love this. I could speak about this definition and examples of it for a whole day. But the loss and the delay could be caused by a lack of interoperability. The farmer could have all of the data, but it may not be flowing through. It may not be flowing through because there may not be standards in place to define uh, the data. So the nomenclature that's used is very, very important. And the noise and the distortion, unfortunately, this is a lot of cases, this is in the marketing area where there are claims to be made about products or words used that actually don't have a proper definition or maybe uh, illegal. And some of the big food companies regularly are challenged uh, in the US and pay massive fines for using words like nutritious, wholesome, healthy, and so on. And they have to back away from using some words that actually don't have a scientific meaning. So when you look at a simple product like an apple, you may think, uh, what's, the, what's, what's, so, what's so different about an apple? Well, I sat down with the, an apple producer in uh, New Zealand. And beside me was a director from uh, the government from MPI, Ministry of Primary Industries. And, and the producer said, John, I love this concept of transparency and trust, but do you think a consumer needs to know that the apples could have sat in a barrel in a dark room for up to eight months before they got to the, the, the supermarket? And I said, absolutely. You, you need to educate consumers about the product and how it got to market. He didn't feel that that was necessary. And in fact, then he went on to say that they actually outsourced the growing of their New Zealand apples to Portland, Oregon. And that's also not declared to the consumer. I think that's very important to disclose. Similarly, if the product is genetically modified in any way, uh, these are things that you can share with consumers. Now I wanna share with you, when you look at transparency, you can look at it from different angles. You can look at it from history-based transparency, and I'll build this together with a model in, in a few moments after I go through trust, and I'll show you how transparency, the different levels of transparency here can be uh, put up against three different levels of, of trust. But I want to point out that this is looking in the rear view mirror. This is the classic domain of traceability and being able to rapidly recall a product. It's, we can call that history-based transparency. Operations transparency is really what's happening right now. Think of real-time uh, data and st strategy-based or strategic transparency is looking to the future. Now, what I wanna go on here is a little bit more complex, but I wanna show you the dilemma that organizations have. At the financial reporting side, organizations are told and, and legislated that they have to keep secrets. 
And then at a certain point of time in the, in the market cycle, they have to release that information to everybody. And there can't be insider trading just to simplify that. So on the one hand, they have to keep the secrets. And then when they do disclose the information, it has to always be truthful. Whereas when we look at supply chains, we talk about opacity on the one side, and we talk about transparency on the other. Now in the middle here, if you look at the secrets or the opacity, it's around IPs, the specs, the formulas. Think of Coca-Cola's uh, recipe. That's a secret. They're gonna keep that as a secret. And that's a storied secret. But things like suppliers, customers, uh, the cost, the margins, their R&D, and even their facilities, the technologies that they use, these are the, the secrets. And on the right-hand side, you have consumers who are very interested in areas around the environment. Uh, was there slavery involved in the supply chain, slave labor, or child labor, uh, any, uh, animal welfare issues, and so on. So the one company in the US, I'll, I'll show you a slide on this in a moment, is Everlane, that they're actually exposing their suppliers, their costs, and their margins, which is kind of interesting. So as you go through this model, if you have trusted B2B relationships, you will trust more and you will share more. But if you don't have those untrusted relationships in your supply chain, you will trust less and you will share less. Now, typically blockchain today has been used in areas where there's a lack of trust in these supply chains, where there's loose affiliations. And this is an area where a blockchain uh, actually excels. So the overuses and abuses of transparency, I'll just go through this uh, quickly. Uh, on the one side here, corporations are using transparency claims to cultivate that impression that they're disclosing uh, everything. And on the right hand side here, you, you, you can have what's called blockchain washing. So blockchain washing is where they're saying, oh yeah, we're using blockchain and we're doing XYZ. You can trust us, like I mentioned with the, 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 uh, the Vietnam case. But in the US, 56% of consumers don't trust eco or green claims for various reasons and quite, uh, quite rightly. At the bottom, you, you, you must remember Enron and WorldCom. They were very transparent and they focused a lot on transparency, but they were being transparent with false information. And this is why Anderson Consulting uh, doesn't exist anymore. They lost their license to operate. And this is now why we have what's called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Now, the example that I, I talked about earlier was uh, Everlane. So the supply chain cost information that they're sharing. But I do want to point out here that there's also involuntary levels of transparency. And Apple were caught twice here. Uh, the Economist disclosed the supply chain cost for the iPhone, which uh, forced uh, Apple to react. When I was advising uh, at APEC around this time, uh, we talked about only about $6 of the cost of a, uh, of the price of a, uh, uh, an iPhone was actually left in China. So what China wanted was the more higher value added work, the engineering work and some of the R&D work, but they were only getting the simple manual labor work. And this is a transition that most economies actually go through. So I wanted to point out that notion. Uh, you can have transparency and you can also have involuntary forms of transparency as well. And I also want to note that disclosure that's mandated by regulation is not transparency. So I'll say that again. If you're mandated by regulation to disclose information, you should not be saying that you're transparent. There are two different notions. In fact, you should consider the notion of transparency related to the voluntary disclosure of information, not the mandatory. That's a very important point. Now, on trust, uh, this is another area that's uh, very complex. Uh, there's about 140 different definitions of trust out there. Rousseau got together with a number of academics and looked at trust and came up with this uh, definition. So where they say that trust is a psychological state comprising of the intention to accept a vulnerability based on the positive expectations and the intentions or behaviors of another. So let me give an example of this working. So you go into a restaurant when you go into a restaurant, you're accepting a vulnerability. You're not cooking the food, you're not preparing the food. So you accept that vulnerability. And as you sit down with, uh, with your family, you have a positive expectations that every single person in the supply chain from the farmers to the processors, to the, the distributors, to the food service and the restaurant itself, and even the pe people in the kitchen, 
you have a positive expectation that every single one of those in the supply chain acts in your best interest. This is really what trust is about. Unfortunately, we, we can trust, but we have to verify. And this is where science comes in. This is critical that we use analytical science and food safety uh, management practices right throughout the supply chain to verify that the products are either genuine and also to verify that they're safe and also those claims that I mentioned earlier to verify that they are actually accurate. Now, supply chain trust model, I want to go through this very quickly, but when you have limited trust in the, in the, in the supply chain, you're going to share limited information. And I'm matching on top of this history-based transparency. As you mature the relationships in your supply chain, you're actually going to start to mature the relationship and you will share more information. And I've modeled on top of this, the operations-based transparency and the strategic-based transparency as well. And for those of you wondering, uh, I'll give you a copy of all of my slides after today. So you don't have to worry about uh, taking any screenshots or notes. You will get a full copy of my slides. And of course, this is all being recorded as well. Now, here's the dilemma that you have as you go through that relationship building in supply chains. Food trust has got two enemies, bad character and bad data. It's impossible to eliminate bad character, but it is possible to reduce the bad data. And this is part of the dilemma that we have with using blockchains. When we talk about the immutability within a blockchain, if you have collusion between different parties, or if you have false data going in there, the immutability of a blockchain actually works against you because your bad data and your collusion creates what I call immutable lies in a blockchain. So again, some people call this is the, the garbage in, garbage out uh, issue. So we always have to watch out for, uh, for that. Now, the good news here is that if you are in an untrusted supply chain and you do use blockchain, at least if you uncover a fraud later, you have the data provenance to go back to the source of that and you will still be able to investigate effectively. We cannot eliminate bad character. Putting in a blockchain creates that illusion that we do eliminate bad character and it's impossible to do that. So here I want to give you, I want to dive into this just a little bit and I'll go through this quite quickly. So imagine you're looking for a company to, uh, to, to build widgets for you. Company A has got a long history of manufacturing high quality widgets and they all do, always deliver on time and to budget. However, the leadership have been accused of unethical behavior such as treating employees and contractors poorly and not being very transparent in the relationship. Where company B has got no history, they're a poor supplier, however, the management have always been very honest and open and transparent about what happened. Now think about that for a moment, which company you would choose. Company A is deemed to have high competence but low integrity, and company B has got high integrity but low competence. Which company would you choose? When I do workshops, most people select company A, and I ask them, why do you select company A? And they said, well, that's what I get measured on. I get measured on getting the right product to the right place at the right time and the right quality. I don't get measured on how management operate. I don't get measured on slave labor. I don't get measured on deforestation or any of that. So I do what I get measured to do. So that component has to change. But let's look at what empirical evidence tells us. Now, this is a slide that I created here. If you look at competence, it's the technical skills, experience and reliability and integrity is about the motives, honesty, and character. So as I build this slide here, firm A gains, gains competence-based trust, which may lead to adverse selection. Adverse selection means that they have hidden, because again, they have low integrity, right? So they have possibly hidden information or hidden characteristics about their business, or they may be lying to you around their capabilities and their competencies before you select them as a supplier. This can lead to significantly higher costs in the supply chain. Now, where can you use a blockchain here? If this company is saying that they're verified as an, uh, are certified to ISO standards, then getting that actual certificate in directly from the certification body would add integrity into the system. 
if you get the uh, the certificate, the ISO certification directly from the producer or the supplier, it could be fraudulent and that happens quite often. So think about blockchain here as connecting the authoritative source. The authoritative source of the ISO certification will be the third party that actually did the certification. And they could provide the information into the blockchain as an independent third party. And that's where you can actually reduce the risk of adverse selection upfront. When you're in the contract, this firm, firm A, also increases the risk of moral hazard. And that moral hazard is around that hidden action and hidden behavior. You remember earlier, we talked about they have uh, high competency but low integrity. This is the company that could get involved in corruption, bribery, frauds, deforestation, and numerous other things because of what we call hidden action and hidden behavior. Again, using a blockchain can help in some aspects of that, but not a lot. Firm B has a, a significant advantages here because you have less risk of increasing transaction costs because they're open and honest. Now, the problem with this is that if they slip up once, it can impact the relationship. And then Keneally and colleagues found that uh, choosing company B uh, was actually more effective at reducing uh, transaction costs over time. They found a tenfold increase in reducing transaction costs. So it's kind of interesting. Now, this, this is interesting for maybe for, for some people. When you look at um, the uh, Edelman Trust Barometer, which came out in January, February this year, competence was only 24% of the predictable variance in trust in, in, in business to business. Ethics and uh, purpose and integrity, where they were around 76%, which is, which is very similar to what I was talking about earlier with the company B uh, versus company A, which is based on competence. Now, something that's also very interesting, in, in that study, only NGOs were seen as ethical. Isn't that interesting? Only NGOs were seen as ethical. You can see government here and media were seen as both uh, less competent and uh, unethical. However, only businesses were seen as competent, but you can see business here are competent, but uh, have lower uh, in, in ethical standards. So what does this mean? This means that in a supply chain, it's in the interest of a business to actually work with an NGO. Because when you, have, uh, when you go down this path of transparency, you have to be prepared for the good and the bad. And this is the challenge. And this was talked about, I think, briefly by one of the speakers earlier, where if you do expose more information in your supply chain, you could be guilty of association. And if you don't disclose, you could be guilty by omission. So these are very, very important uh, trade-offs that you have within a supply chain. So maturing transparency and trust together. Um, here, again, down at the bottom here, you have history-based transparency on the left, operations and strategic, as I mentioned. And on the right-hand side here from Shapiro, identification-based trust maps to that, knowledge-based trust match, maps to the operational transparency, and then calculus-based trust on the bottom right to history-based transparency. Now, contracts, B2B contracts and regulation are down here in calculus-based trust. It's risk-based management. And risk-based management is normally based on mistrust. Mistrust is based on experience. And then there's another term called distrust, which is different again, and distrust is based on uh, suspicion. So think of countries or firms that are not as transparent. If they're not transparent, it would build suspicion, and that suspicion is the distrust. So this is an important notion to, uh, to note. The key in this slide here, and this is part of my own research, is that voluntary methods of trust building are more effective in building strong supply chain relationships. And again, if you have an intention to be strategic in transparency and you're sharing information about your, your market and the growth of the market and how you can take your suppliers with you, but your operations people and your procurement are stuck down in calculus-based trust, you have a mismatch. And that's the key message from that slide. Now, technology complexity, I'll speed up a little bit uh, going through this. I wanna talk here about the, the three Ds and I wanna Keep this, uh, keep this in the back of your mind. The benefits of using blockchain are around the 3Ds, democratization, 
easier access to, uh, to data and to information that was previously locked away in uh, multiple systems. The decentralization component, uh, centralization is not always the best way to go. And the disintermediation or taking out the middlemen is, is, uh, is important. And lots of different buzzwords and technologies out there. Think of those three Ds. Now let's look at blockchain uh, briefly. Here's the things that we see and we hear. We hear about blockchain being unhackable, timestamped, trusted protocols, secure technology, and so on. But we also hear about smart contracts. Now, the point I want to make here is that smart contracts is usually lumped in with, with blockchain, and it should not be. Smart contracts predates blockchain by 11 years. Nothing new here. Smart contracts does not have to be executed on a blockchain. And in fact, a lot of the blockchain projects that are out there today are more smart contract projects rather than blockchain projects. We also hear about encryption, but as Fiona and others have said earlier, we've had encryption and cryptography for, for decades, uh, right back to Turing uh, during the Second World War. We just got better and better. So we know how to do this. We know how to do the, the cryptography. Uh, we know how, much, how to do smart contracts. And we know about blockchains. Now, blockchain, we talk a lot about uh, building trust in supply chains. It can enhance trust. And I'll go on to that in, in just a moment. But what I want you to think of, blockchain is not a technology per se. And I know that's a hard concept for me to, to say and to comprehend, but think of a car. You can say that a car is a technology, but like a car, a blockchain is multiple technologies, tools and methods that are configured together to solve a business problem. So generally speaking, no two blockchains will be the same. So we can't talk about blockchain as being something you can buy off the shelf. I want a blue blockchain, a red blockchain. I want 15 feet of blockchain. We have to configure blockchains specifically to solve unique use cases. And that's a very important notion. Now, there is a, some struggles out there with, uh, and this one here talks literally about that. The struggle is real. And if you go down to the parts that I've highlighted, they're saying there are very few uh, successful implementations beyond uh, proof of concepts or pilots. And there's little known about the obstacles. So in what this article does, it actually looks at on the left-hand side, the promises of blockchain, improving transparency, securing the information, enhancing trust, and improving operational performance. And the obstacles on the right-hand side, like culture, uh, necessity, and the confidence in the technology, the information sharing, and that, uh, that's a scary part for a lot of organizations because you protect that inf information that could damage your competitive positioning. And of course, the cost and, uh, and the, the regulations around privacy and GDPR and so on and the technology immaturity. So there's a lot of things that actually build. So the things that are driving us and there are things that are obstacles today. And we just need to do more research to actually drive those out. The best way to look at a blockchain is to look at it from a use case perspective. The thing I like, one of the unintended consequences of a blockchain, is actually forcing companies to uh, improve the data that they have. So blockchain industry views, this is one that uh, everybody knows from uh, Walmart. It took, uh, used to take seven days to do, the, uh, to do a recall and Frank Yanis, my uh, good buddy, Frank is now uh, the second in command at the US FDA. And, and this was touted a lot with IBM Food Trust project. It took 2.2 seconds. Now you don't need to do a recall in 2.2 uh, seconds. And in fact, what Frank admitted last year at the conference I was at in the US is that um, this project was actually wrong. And I'll say that again, this project, while it was good and they talked about the benefits, this speaks to exactly the point that I was very critical of, of this project in the start. And Frank admitted this last year, that the project, when it did the 2.2 seconds for a trace back, it actually traced it back to Mexico in 2.2 seconds. But Mexico was not the source of the product. Mexico was the data provenance source. Brazil was the actual source of the product. The geographical source or origin was Brazil. So again, here's an example of a fantastic uh, case study. Uh, I'm not, I don't want to take away from the value of this project, but you have to really mine into the details to figure out, has it delivered on the success that it was intended? 
And again, to reiterate, data provenance is not the same as the geographic provenance of the product. Subway have said it's not for us. The issue that Subway had was immutability because problems occur in the supply chain and you need to be able to change the data. So one of the several papers I've written on blockchain is that researchers need to look at the potential for mutability uh, within supply chains. I know that's counterintuitive, but this was the issue that, uh, that Subway had. Gary is a good friend and Gary has got 30,000 suppliers. Uh, those 30,000 suppliers supply about a thousand large companies, including a lot of food service. And his customers uh, are saying to him on a regular basis, no, we don't need blockchain. We have their centralized platform. So blockchain reality check. When the discussion comes to blockchain, there seems to be no middle ground. It's either hyping or bashing. On the one hand, it's uh, a lot of focus on crypto, but not a lot on understanding blockchain and how it works. And some will say that it's, yeah, it's a silver bullet and others will say, you know what, my bullshit meter just went up into, uh, into the red and it's not what it says it is. So Hannah Halliburton, as a former uh, assistant vice president, our assistant uh, professor at Harvard, she's now with New York Stern Business School. She was formerly up to uh, recently, in fact, uh, chief economist at the Canadian uh, Central Bank. And I like what she says here is that optimism in the face of novelty and uncertainty of a new technology is not a new phenomenon, but it does affect the economy. The economy. Uh, and this optimism also appears in estimates quoted by the media that indicate large cost savings, but do not offer much uh, about how the cost savings will be will occur. And herein, it lies on us as academics, as researchers, as practitioners, to be able to show the use cases and prove the value uh, of uh, blockchain. This is where I see blockchain today. Uh, it's got a head, it's got an ass, so we know where it's going and we know where it stops. But we still have to put more meat on the bone, and we, we can do that by having more uh, use cases. So the truth about blockchain, this is a very important one, I think from the Harvard Business School is blockchain it should be seen as foundational, not disruptive. Uh, again, you have my permission. If somebody talks about blockchain as being disruptive, you can say that John Kyo said, you have to leave the room right now. We have to take our time. We have to be patient. Blockchain will be foundational. It's gonna take us a long time to implement, but when we do, it's gonna have significant societal benefits and value. So resilience, this is now where I expand the picture to, uh, to get you to think differently and to think more broadly than just blockchain. This is an eye chart, I know that, but again, you're gonna get this in your, your handout, but this is the reality of the, of the food chain and it's all of its uh, complexity. Now, if you wanna build resilience, you have to look at where can a shock enter the system? A shock can enter the system through geopolitical strife or it could be uh, via climate change, it could be food security issues, uh, drought or weather conditions, it could be technology, it could be energy and many, many other areas. But as we've seen with uh, COVID, we haven't had a, a lot of success at interoperability at connecting up the farming side and then on the front side with consumers. So what actually happened in, uh, during COVID, and I wrote several articles around this, it doesn't matter which country you're in, many, many countries were talking about, oh, we have food security issues. We, we never had food security issues per se. What we had is, I, I've termed, we have a food uncertainty issue. And that food uncertainty issue is driven from the fact that we lack interoperability between our systems. We know we have enough food, we just don't know where it is. And these are the complex challenges that we have and which is why I, I refer to people talking about uh, the th another 3D model in the supply chain to, to distinguish uh, what we're doing here. On the one hand, we have digitization, which is basically moving from analog to digital. So that's digitization. Then we have digitalization. Now digitalization is very different because digitalization is around business process automation and role automation. That's when they've already been digitized. And the third component is around digital transformation, the third D. And digital transformation has little to do with the technology itself. It's got more to do with the customer journey and change management within an organization. And especially 
in big organizations, this is one of the bigger challenges. And we, what we now see during COVID is the power of government to be able to regulate or to mandate things to happen. And this, this in various countries in Canada, um, the, the government takes a, a, a back approach, a back office approach, but in British Columbia, in our Western uh, province, the government jumped in and took control of the supply chain to make sure we had ethical distribution of food and also of, uh, of PPE. In the US, you saw the government putting in the War Measures Act uh, to uh, get the companies to continue to produce food, but to reduce or to take away the liability that those companies had if employees got sick. And of course that did happen, but these companies are now protected. So the governments wield significant power and they have authority to jump in and do more things. However, in Canada, we had a case where the, the government's own food safety inspectors who have to go into the, the beef and the, the other processing plants, they have to go in there to, uh, to certify that the meat is at a certain level of quality and grading. And their union said, we're not going in. So the government's own employees, their union said, we're not going into those processing plants because they're unsafe. They've had several outbreaks of COVID. So when that happened in Canada, you had three plants in Alberta that were closed down. That was 80% of all the beef supply in Canada. Again, you think, do we have a food security issue? Not really. And would 14 days impact us? No, not really, because we know the volumes that were processed and we know the volumes that are actually in storage and we actually export significant amounts. So we could still have significant volume for domestic supply. But herein lies the key notion that I want to get across. Systems thinking in context of food chains will help us understand the cascading consequences of system failures. The cascading consequences of system failures. So in this case, there was a system failure because the government inspectors could not inspect the food and that had cascading consequences. This is very, very important. And that kind of sets up the scene for where I want to take this conversation now. For those of you who are not too familiar with technology, let me use this metaphor of a car. You're driving a car, you see here, you have a GPS, which is giving you a direction and you have uh, road signs uh, up ahead. Think of your supply chain and think of yourself driving in a car. <clears throat> You're looking out the front windscreen of the car. You're using a GPS, which is using AI and machine learning, and it's pulling in data from multiple sources. And it's given you a signal to say that there's an obstacle one kilometer ahead. That, that obstacle one kilometer ahead was, was, was determined based on data that's coming in from multiple sources. I call that a tripwire. So using technology as a tripwire to warn you of something that's up ahead before it happens, and this is very important, before it happens. And then you have what I call a circuit breaker. And the circuit breaker here, you can see on the GPS, it's actually telling you to turn off the highway and giving you an alternative route. That's how you could see AI and machine learning in a supply chain. Now I talked about IOT and about real time. Think of IOT and real time nature of supply chains as you're sitting in your car and you're interpreting the sensors in the car. You're also looking out your window left and right. This is like the real time what's happening now inside my car. You have all of the check lights that you can look at. And this is where I mentioned that blockchain is like looking in the rear view mirror of the supply chain because blockchain is a registry of transactions of things that happened. Do you remember what I said earlier? It's history-based transparency. Now, the reason I put a cyclist in the rear view mirror is to show you that there is value in the data that's in your blockchain registry, especially when you unleash that data and you have significant historical data where AI and machine learning can learn from that and point out obstacles from that data, whether it's trends or other stuff. So there is value in that data. I'm not denigrating uh, blockchain to a lesser role, but putting it in context of driving a vehicle, think about your supply chain. A blockchain will not get you to the future. A blockchain cleans up what you've already done. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the uh, unintended consequences of blockchain is better data governance within organizations. 
Now, the reason I'm pointing out all of this is that here's the, the model that I talked about. Here's the concept that I talked about. And I build on McDonald and Corsi's model here, which looks at event discovery versus recovery. And this is why I say that tripwires are very important because they provide you with that early warning system before something has happened. And before something happens, you have a circuit breaker. Now, I was happy to see that uh, governments are starting to use these terms as tripwires and circuit breakers in context of COVID. So a tripwire in the context of COVID, just to bring it to our real life situation, is, is simulation of the uh, outbreaks of infections. And then the circuit breaker could be a lockdown. So you can use this in multiple uh, contexts, but in your supply chain, warning you of something that could occur, can occur, uh, pulling in data from, uh, it could be risk management tools that are out there around uh, weather patterns, drought, strife, uh, and so on, uh, or food fraud. And then you, you can take a circuit breaker uh, action. And the reason that um, that's important, if you look down here at, at uh, item D, uh, this company had a plan, yes. Uh, it was partially used. Was it rehearsed? Was unknown. It took weeks to discover, months to recover, and $100 million was the cost of that. So this is why I'm saying that even, even the ones that are caught on the same day, that's too late. You have to catch these data, these things before they happen. So this is the predictive nature of supply chains that's very important. So in summary, one of the things that I find is quite, quite often missing, and I've used this model for many years. Um, I, I've headed up consulting at HP in, uh, in Canada, but I also started my career at, uh, at DEC in, uh, in Ireland and then in the Netherlands. And at DEC, we were Digital Equipment Corporation. We were very strong at, uh, at analogies and models around consulting. We had a four uh, view model and I've added two more views to that. So as you look at a use case, I would encourage you to look at the business view. Now, when I'm doing an advisory, the business view breaks down into about 30 or 40 different questions, the technical view at the same way. So this is just a high level overview. So the business view, what is it that I want to achieve? The technical view, how will it be built? How will my blockchain be built? The functional view, what, what will this system give me when it's, uh, when it's finished? How will I implement this? Very important. What standards do I need to comply with, whether it's industry standards or uh, global standards or, or whatever? And what policies or regulations do I need to abide by? If you take these six views of a solution, it will help you to bulletproof it. And you'll have hopefully a more successful uh, use case. If you don't, you'll constantly be putting out fires. The other thing I want to point out is this is Trevor Clossy. Uh, Trevor is a lecturer at, uh, at, at uh, GMIT, and he's got this uh, fantastic uh, learning set and uh, which comes with his book. So when you buy his book, you actually get PowerPoint presentations broken down into these multiple modules here. Highly recommended, fantastic uh, read, great materials, very, very relevant. Um, also, uh, I've done a series of uh, what I call the Future of Food 10 by 10 blockchain series in October. That's 10 minutes talking with 10 blockchain companies. Uh, all of those videos are here and you can see that uh, Fiona Delaney is, uh, was also with us on that, but a number of other companies as well. So these videos, they're short 10 minute videos. Some of them extend to 11 minutes or so, but very, very informative. The questions I asked there were consistent. What are the key challenges in the food industry, and where are the, uh, the where are the areas where blockchain could be beneficial? And not to be outdone with just listening to those technology companies, I have four academics, and these four academics, uh, including Trevor, um, will be on a panel discussion next Monday, and all four academics uh, have reviewed the ten videos, and we'll talk about this next week on Monday. So I would encourage you to sign up for that. There's still some space uh, available. It's at 10 o'clock uh, in the morning on Monday, the 23rd, and uh, kindly sponsored by Swiss Decode. And uh, it should be a great session. We're gonna go through all of the things that uh, you ever wanted to know. Plus there's also the opportunity to, uh, to ask questions. So just my summary points, transparency is no longer optional. Transparency and trust must be matured together. 
technology does not replace natural science. When someone is saying that my blockchain can enhance food safety, can eliminate food fraud, no, it cannot. It can contribute to it, but the only way to verify some, a product is genuine or not is through analytical testing. A blockchain label, they, they won't, uh, you cannot confirm it with that. Blockchain is historical data, like looking in the rear view mirror. Data and information quality is critical to success. Standards-based interoperability is key. And again, from a blockchain perspective, you have uh, GS1, uh, they have their EPCIS standard, which is also the ISO standard for data interoperability. And you have companies like Slovenia-based uh, Origin Trail, who was also one of the, uh, the interviewees that doesn't have a, a blockchain per se, but they have a protocol based on GS1 standards that allows you to share information. In fact, you can put a node at each farm where the farmer determines which information they want to share and it helps to solve that problem of data on the farm and monetizing it. Current skills and competencies are insufficient and must be augmented with systems thinking. Think of what I said, the cascading consequences of system failures, very, very important. Any system or platform you put in place, you have to look at it that way. And sweat in peacetime, you'll bleed less in uh, wartime, which means that you've got to practice your contingencies around the system down. So thank you for that. And I'm just at the 60 minutes. Excellent. Thanks very much, John. And uh, you even got a plug in there for, for Trevor's book. I don't suppose Trevor does one for everybody in the audience, is there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, there may be, there may be. <laughs> you can send on the, the hyperlink. We'll, we'll download it on that Russian site anyway. Look, it, <laughs> it's almost 10 past 12. Uh, John, you were on time. We were late starting. Um, if there's, don't forget, John is, is going to be around for the discussion for 45 minutes at the end. If there is one pressing question um, from anybody. Hi, John. I just have a question there. Um, Trevor here. Hi, Trevor. Yeah, yeah, I really loved your um, rear, rear view mirror um, analogy. It's, it's really succinct and on point. And just in terms of the standards and the policies, do you, do you think on a global scale, we, we, we have a lot of catching up to do if we're going to make this a kind of, you know, blockchain is the go-to thing here? Yeah, we, we, have a, we have a lot of catching up to do. There's a lot of uncertainty. In fact, I was brought in by the largest uh, food association in the world. And the reason I was brought in was because the food companies felt that uh, some of the technology players uh, were forcing, and, and some of the, the, the let's, let's, let's be clear, a retailer was forcing blockchain on the industry. And the, uh, the food companies brought me in to say, John, what's really happening? How should we approach this? Um, it got to, to such a point where um, the food companies themselves, the producers, didn't want technology players in the room with them. Because when you look back at the history here, traceability and the ability to recall has actually been blocked by retailers for decades. Retailers just said, look, you know what? I, I don't care if you can do specific down to a lottery batch or you can tell me that of the 100 products I have on the shelf, only 10 of them are on recall. I want you to take everything away. And by the way, I'm going to send you a penalty uh, for that. And, uh, and if you don't replenish with new stock within one or two days, you'll lose the shelf space as well. So there's a lot of tension or friction in the supply chain today between the various trading partners. Blockchain can help to reduce that friction if it's approached in the right way. Unfortunately, marketing has gotten the better of a lot of the conversations and, uh, and we need to tone the marketing down a little bit. We need to look at what industry is using today and for more than 40 years, they've been using GS1 standards. So when companies have gone into the big food companies and said, you know what, it's blockchain, it's our blockchain or GS1, that's the wrong conversation. It has to be based on the foundation layers that industry has in place today, which is the GS1 standards for data and for interoperability. And if the company goes in with that pitch, it'll be a better pitch and it'll reduce the friction within that company and it reduces friction within the supply chain as well. So I think from uh, Trevor, if we follow the GS1 standards as much as possible in the food chain, we're reducing that friction and we will get to the end point of uh, better deployments of, uh, of blockchain and improved traceability. In fact, uh, I'll finish on this point. Just this summer, um, IBM, uh, Foodlogic, Ripe.io, 
and uh, uh, who was the other company? There was another company in there. They did an interoperable, oh, was, uh, I think it was SAP. Uh, I could have been Oracle, but I think it was SAP. They did an interoperability uh, test using GS1 standards for fish and it was successful. And this is the new normal is that companies have to be able to collaborate uh, today. This notion of I want to capture, I want to own all of the data won't work anymore. So think of uh, all of these different companies that have blockchains and ERP systems. They need to have standards where they can protect the investment that their companies have made, that companies or customers have made, and they can still share data. And I would encourage people to look at what's called a PTI initiative, Produce Traceability Initiative in the US, where there are seven attributes that all players decided to share. Now, there could be a thousand different technology platforms out there, but these seven attributes are standardized. Everybody understands them and every system can talk the same language and we have interoperability based on standards. So that's probably the, the, the best example of uh, something that works today. That's brilliant. Thanks a million, John.